Shooting heads are a great tool for distance casting, but it's a lot more than that. The easy change of line also allows you to change tactics and fishing depth within a matter of minutes. But the great thing about shooting heads, in my opinion, is that you can customize them. There are a lot of ready-made, ready-to-go shooting heads on the market today, and they are really good. But if you customize your own shooting heads, you can customize lines to suit not only your casting, but also where you're fishing. If you have a look at where I'm standing now, I'm quite close to the bank and there's a forest right behind me and a cast with a normal line or even a normal shooting head would place my fly in the trees behind me. For a situation like this, I've tailor-made a shooting head. For this five weight rod, it's only six and a half meters long. It doesn't provide you with the prettiest casts on the planet, but it really solves a fishing situation. Because as you can see, with this short shooting head, I can fish very easily without hitting the bank. And even though here we're on a beach where overhead casting is the norm, this short shooting head also allows me to make relatively long spay casts with ease. When you're spay casting the shooting head, the exact same principles as when you're spay casting a weight forward line applies. So you still have to think about all the same essentials. Spay casting a short and relatively heavy shooting head like this to a distance of maybe about 18-20 meters is relatively easy. Basically any fly line can fall into three categories. There's the weight forward line, there's the double taper line, and there's the shooting head system. Double taper lines are not commonly used anymore. Weight, for weight forward lines is probably the most common line, and shooting head systems is a specialty line that you can use for both distance casting and for customizing, which we'll be taking a look at shortly. If we take two different weight forward lines, these are both weight forward five, they're both floating, but they are very different. So let's just take a quick look at how to decode the information on the back of these fly lines. Now, most fly lines made today come with a, an explanation, so to speak, on the properties of the line. If we take a look, at this first line. Basically a weight forward line consists of a thin running line, a rear taper, a belly, a front taper and a tip. Most manufacturers today give you the information on the length of the different parts of the line and mainly you will often be able to read the head length of the line in this case, it's a weight forward five, so it's 7.4 meters long on this line and also the total length of the line. If we just take a quick look at another weight forward five line, the information on the back of the box actually tells us that this is a very different line. Now this particular line doesn't give the total head length, but if we add up the different parts of the tapers and the belly, you will come up with a head length of just under 21 meters which means that this is a specialty distance casting line. The main difference between the weight forward lines and the shooting head system is that with the shooting head system, you can change your shooting head. You can go from long to short, or you can go from floating to sinking, which is some of the things that I also talked about in the movie when we looked at casting with the shooting heads. Basically, the shooting lines fall into two categories. There is the monofilament type, which is technically the same as, for instance, your leader or your tippet material. 
and there is the coated shooting line which is made like a normal fly line with a coating on top of a core. When it comes to casting and fishing with the shooting head, you will probably cast further with a monofilament shooting line. It's also a little bit more difficult to handle. It's slippery, you will lose it, you drop it a little bit easier when you're casting. Whereas with the coated shooting line, your cast looks a little bit better, it's easier to handle, but you will not cast quite as far. The shooting heads themselves, these days, most of the time comes with factory made loops like this one. But for customizing purposes, let's now take a look at how you can customize your own shooting heads and make your own loops. So let's take a more detailed look at how to customize your own shooting heads. The first thing that you want to decide is obviously how long you want the shooting head to be. If you want a short one for confined space or a longer one for longer casts along the Danish coastline, for instance. After that, you need to decide how heavy you want it to be. I usually use this guideline for the weight for my shooting heads. A five weight rod casts approximately 12 grams, a six weight, 14 grams, a seven weight, 16 grams, and eight weight, 18 grams. That said, there are no rules. If you prefer 14 grams on your five weight, then a modern fly rod can easily handle that. A good and cheap source for shooting heads is actually ordering mill end double taper fly lines online. They're quite cheap, so there's plenty of room for experimentations and even making mistakes. A general rule to go by is that if you buy a line that is two ratings higher than the rod you want to use it for, for instance, you can buy a nine weight double taper for a seven weight rod, then you'll usually end up with a shooting head anywhere between nine and a half and say 10 meters. In this case, I want to make an even shorter shooting head for my seven weight rod. That means I've got a 10 weight double taper line and I've roughly cut it to length. So the first thing I do after I've cut it to length is to weigh it. Now you can use a spring scale like this one, or you can use a digital letter scale. So let's check and see. This line is just a little bit too heavy still. So I simply take my scissors, cut off a small piece at a time, check it again, and now it weighs just slightly above 16, 16 grams. So when I strip off a little bit of coating to make my spliced loop, it will be spot on. So we've hit the correct weight, just around 16 grams. The line is now around seven and a half meters long, which is perfect. I want to use this line in a small river for fishing sea trout. The short and heavy line will also help me carry the big flies that I use for sea trout fishing in the rivers. So we're ready to make some loops. There are basically two different methods that you can use. One is where you strip off a piece of the coating and splice a loop on the braided core of the fly line. And the other is where you use a piece of heat shrink tube and actually melt a loop on the fly line. So let me show you how to make them both. So we're ready to splice a loop on this fly line. To begin with, we want to remove about 10 centimeters of coating from the line. The easiest way of doing this is to simply use a short piece of strong gel spun backing or even a piece of fire line or something similar. Make a loop, insert the fly line or the shooting head into the loop, make sure that you have about 10 centimeters of line and just 
tighten down hard so that the backing bites into the coating of the fly line. Now grab hold of the backing, hold the fly line inside your hand so that you can pull along the length of the line and then in one long pull we simply remove the coating from the core. On some fly lines there's a primer which is put onto the core before the coating goes on which makes it very difficult to make a loop. The only way to remove this primer is to dip the core into some acetone but on this line I won't have any problems. Take a small needle and fray the end simply by inserting the needle into the core and pulling it through. This can be a little tricky but just be patient. You want to fray about a centimeter or a little more like that. Split this frayed end into approximately two halves. You don't have to count the fibers, just approximately. And then cut away one half. Like that. Now take your needle, this is just a, a sewing machine needle. Insert the needle into the core, just where the coating begins. And push it up through the core. Push it down till you have about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half, and then push it out through the side of the core. Now take a piece of thin monofilament and insert one end through the eye of the needle. Keep a hold of one end and insert the other end through the eye of the needle. Now simply pull the two ends of the monofilament through the core and out. Remove the needle and shorten the loop. Make sure that the loop points to the end of the fly line. Now simply insert the frayed end through the loop, tighten it down just a little bit and now pull it back so that the loop sits in roughly the middle part of the frayed end. Then simply grab hold of your monofilament and slowly, carefully pull the core back through itself. Now you can adjust the size of your loop. Not too small, not too big, something like that. In order to tighten this loop down firmly, use something small and round. I just happen to have this one lying around. Insert it through the loop and pull tight. And you can actually see already this loop will never come undone. I've now tightened the loop down on itself, so to speak. And with my scissors, I simply cut off the waist end just where it exits the core just above where the coating begins. This loop is now ready for some glue. The glue itself doesn't make the connection or the loop stronger but it does secure it for water so that water doesn't come up through the core of the fly line. Use any sort of glue that will bind onto PVC. Make sure that the glue remains soft as it dries. Simply add a thin layer of glue to the core all the way to the point where the loop opens into the loop itself. Just a thin layer is enough. These types of glues often dry relatively fast and depending on how thick the coating is where the loop begins, you might have to add a couple of coats more of glue. Make sure you don't have big drops. Simply leave this to dry, check if it needs another coat or two and you're ready to go. The other way of making loops on fly lines is quite simple and very elegant. What you need is a 
heat gun that doesn't produce too high a temperature. This one was bought in a craft store. You need some shrink tube, which you can buy in ele any electronics store, and of course your fly line. Finally, you need a sharp knife. I use a scalpel, but you can use a small Stanley knife or anything. So the first thing to do is to cut the very tip of the fly line a long cut at an angle. The longer you can make this cut, the better. The best way of doing it is simply to place the line on the table and then with the knife at an angle push it slowly through and make a nice sloping cut. Now choose a piece of heat shrink tube. It comes in different diameters. You want a piece that you can just fit the doubled fly line through. If you use a a piece with too big a diameter, you won't get the pressure needed to actually bond these two together. Now fold the fly line so that the cut part of the loop meets the other half of the line. Adjust the loop size. You want to aim to melt together approximately one to two centimeters of fly line. So this looks about right. And now make a fold and work the doubled fly line up through the shrink tube. Now you want to make sure that a piece of, of the shrink tube goes past where the loop ends because you want to protect this piece of line from, from the worst heat. And the same when you cut off your shrink tube leave a couple of centimeters that sticks past the end of the loop because we don't want to melt this part together otherwise it'll be very difficult to remove the shrink tube once it's melted. Check and see if that it's all parallel inside the tube and then turn on your heat gun. Make sure it points away from yourself and just give it a minute or, or two to heat up to the right temperature. When you begin melting the fly line, it's very important that you move it constantly and make sure that it doesn't discolor, because if it discolors, it will crystallize and become hard. So move it around all the time so it doesn't become too hot and you will be able to clearly see when it melts together. Once it melts it together, quickly place it on the table and roll it. Don't keep your fingers on it for too long because it is quite hot. This just adds that last bit of pressure that you need to fuse the line together and to make it nice and round. There we are. Give it a minute or two to cool off. And then simply with your scissors cut through the shrink tube grab a hold of it and pull it open. And there you have it.